Hey everyone, Contrail here, and welcome to the first layer of the most complete iceberg. This video has been a long time coming, I've been working on this for a while now, and I cannot wait to share this with you all. But before we get into this, there are just a few things that I want to say. Firstly, and this is probably obvious, but I have a face cam for the video. So this is pretty much my face reveal for the channel, not gonna make a super big deal out of it. Secondly, I mighta, kinda, sorta mighta clickbaited you just a little bit. This is not in fact the most complete iceberg to ever be constructed on YouTube, actually probably far from it. If that were the case, the iceberg would probably be comically large and just an absolute nightmare to turn into a video. By most complete, I pretty much mean that the iceberg incorporates a wide variety of topics that are ranked by how obscure they are, with a small consideration to how disturbing and interesting they are as well. I personally enjoy icebergs that have a wide variety of entries and topics on them rather than some of the hyper-focused single-topic icebergs on YouTube, so that was pretty much my motivation behind making this. That and I've always wanted to make an iceberg anyways, so I figured this was kind of the perfect time and the perfect topic, so. I'm also going to say that there are probably a few entries on here that you've already heard of. Because of that, I'm going to try and keep the generally well-known topics pretty brief. That way we can save a lot more time for the other entries that may be more interesting or obscure. I'm also going to have chapters on the timeline. That way you can skip past an entry if you just don't want to hear it. Third, this iceberg is going to have a little something that I like to call tension breakers built into the list. Essentially, if we cover a few super disturbing or dark topics in a row, I might throw in something that is maybe slightly funny or maybe just kind of benign, just to kind of keep things rolling smoothly. Um, while they might not be super noticeable in these first few layers, we will definitely be needing them towards the bottom of the iceberg. Okay, one final point, and then we will get into layer one. I spent a pretty decent amount of time putting this iceberg together from gathering and researching over 360 entries to placing them into the 15 layers that you will be seeing on the screen right now, and I think I did a pretty decent job. So if you enjoy this video, maybe consider dropping a comment and subscribing. I'd greatly appreciate it, and it just lets me know if I'm going in the right direction or not. So without further ado, let's get into the first layer of the most complete iceberg. Bigfoot. Bigfoot, otherwise known as Sasquatch, is more or less one of the most well-known cryptids or unexplained phenomena of all time. I mean, like, seriously, who doesn't know about Bigfoot? Bigfoot is often described as a tall, hairy, bipedal creature that resembles either a primate or a human with notably large feet, hence its name. It is native to North America, specifically the Pacific Northwest. Although it has been entertained as a potentially real creature by scientists, it's widely considered to be nothing but a cryptid. Despite this, there are a substantial number of people who do believe the Bigfoot is real and have created legitimate organizations to try and locate one for study. Although, something to note is that almost every corner of the globe has their own version of Bigfoot, some of which we will probably be mentioning later on in this iceberg. This could either point to its credibility of existence, or further show how humans are prone to creating these large, human-like beasts in their own image. Yeah, so like I said, I'm gonna keep the first few that are super well-known just really brief, um, and Bigfoot is obviously one of them. But yeah, I personally believe that if Bigfoot exists, then like, I really think we would have found some like substantial concrete evidence. Like, the idea that this huge, like, primate creature could just be traipsing through the Pacific Northwest wilderness, it just doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Like, at the very least, I feel like we would have found, like, a carcass or some bones, at the very least, if not a live specimen. So, I don't know, you know, leave your thoughts in the comments below. I personally don't believe in Bigfoot, but a lot of other people do. Anyways, let's move on to the next one. UFOs 
UFOs are another contender for the most well-known unexplained phenomena of all time. The term UFO stands for Unidentified Flying Object, which is a very broad term that could be used to describe literally any aerial object that cannot be recognized. However, the term has more or less been hijacked by conspiracy theorists and extraterrestrial believers. More often than not, when someone talks about UFOs, it's in reference to aliens and their spaceships. It's to the extent that the study of extraordinary sightings of aircraft, aliens or otherwise, is known as ufology. I'm pretty sure that most everybody has at least some kind of a UFO story, um, at least in some capacity. Whether or not they believe it's from an alien or it's just something that they couldn't identify. I personally have had at least three encounters with UFOs. Although, looking back on them now, I'm 99% sure that two of them were just looking at like a satellite passing through the sky. And then the last one was kind of like, I guess, a flying disc somewhat, but I'm pretty sure it was just a plane that was flying at a weird angle, so I just couldn't see the uh, rear stabilizer or whatever you call it. But yeah, anyways, uh, I think we're going to move on. The Loch Ness Monster. The Loch Ness Monster is a large creature that supposedly inhabits the freshwater lake of Loch Ness in the Scottish Highlands. Accounts of the creature supposedly date back to the 6th century, but sightings really began picking up in the 1930s. This was when a rash of sightings and photos reinvigorated public interest beyond folktales including the famous Surgeon's Photograph, which has now been analyzed and deemed to be a hoax. Similar to Bigfoot, it has gained a cult following of those who believe it exists, as well as those who consider it to be a novel part of pop culture. Efforts to locate the Loch Ness Monster, including aerial and sonar scans of the water, have all ended with no evidence to support its existence. So fun fact about me, I've actually been to Loch Ness in Scotland, and I've got to say, man, it's a beautiful place, but at the same time, I don't think it's harboring something as big as the Loch Ness Monster. I personally think that the Loch Ness Monster is in like the same camp as Bigfoot, where if it really did exist, I think that we would have found some kind of like solid evidence as to its existence. Whether or not like some bones or like a carcass or, you know, even detecting it like they've been trying to do with sonar. And the thing with the Loch Ness Monster is that like it's in a relatively small body of water. I mean, compared to something as big as the Pacific Northwest, this should be way easier to find than Bigfoot. And the fact that we haven't been able to find really any solid evidence since it became a local legend. I just, I don't think the odds are high that it's real. Not to say that it isn't a fun story to, you know, pass around and have fun with, but it's, yeah, I don't think it's real. Anyways, let's move on to the next one. Big Pharma. Big Pharma is a decently popular conspiracy theory surrounding the true capabilities and motives of the pharmaceutical industry. There are multiple manifestations of the overarching Big Pharma conspiracy, so I'm just going to name some of the popular aspects. Essentially, people believe that the wider pharmaceutical industry has been suppressing effective treatments or outright cures for diseases, and will instead promote less effective treatments to draw greater profit from selling more of the less effective treatments. This is obviously super unethical to withhold more effective treatments for the sake of profit, but it is unfortunately not an uncommon tactic in business nowadays. There's also a facet of this conspiracy that believes Big Pharma suppresses working aspects of Eastern medicine as well as holistic and natural cures for diseases by discrediting them to the greater public. Also, the idea of vaccine hesitancy and many of the COVID-19 conspiracy theories have roots within the wider Big Pharma conspiracy. Out of everything I've talked about so far, I think that this has the biggest possibility of being real. I mean, the idea of governments and companies hiding their true capabilities is not really a new concept. I mean, we've pretty much been doing something similar to this with 
kind of any form of advanced technology, whether it be weapons, you know, pharmaceuticals in this case, um, or just like general abilities, you know, that we keep under lock and key. Now that's not to say that I, you know, believe in all of the weird, you know, COVID-19, you know, vaccine shit. I don't think they're injecting nanobots. I just think that there are definitely some technologies that, you know, corporations and the governments just aren't letting us in on because it would be bad for their profits or it would be bad for like the rest of the world, maybe for like national security or something. I just don't think that corporations or governments are willing to just put all their cards on the table. You know what I'm saying? But yeah, I think we should just move on to the next one. Orphan Source An orphan source is defined as a self-contained radioactive source that is no longer under regulatory control. To put it in layman's terms, it is something radioactive that has gone missing and cannot be found by a regulatory agency, whether it be the company or government that once possessed it, or another body that knew of its existence. An orphan source could be anything from a small capsule of iridium-192 or selenium-75 used in an industrial radiography machine to a missing nuclear warhead. And as crazy as that last one may sound, it has happened before and it is just as terrifying as you would think. Orphan sources have been the cause of much alarm and disaster when they are exposed to the public. Namely, the Goyonia incident, in which a capsule of cesium-137 from a medical imaging device was opened by a scrapper in Goyonia, Brazil. Four would perish as a result of the contamination, and hundreds more were injured and disfigured. The concept of an orphan source to me is just... it... Ah, I, I, I don't like it at all. Because radiation is not something that you have an immediate bearing of. Like, there's no, I guess, indications that anything is wrong until it's already too late. I, I just, I don't know if I can convey properly how terrifying that would be. To just like go to sleep and think everything's okay and then, you know, you wake up the next morning like, oh, I kind of, I got a headache. You know, you, you drink some water, maybe you're just dehydrated. And then like a couple days into it, it's like, oh, I'm starting to get blisters. I'm starting to spit up blood. And it's like, what is going on? And then you discover that like, hey, somebody threw like a weird silver thing onto your back porch and that's been like leaching radiation into your sleeping space. I don't know, just the idea that something can kill you so efficiently and like without any prior warning signs is just, it. I don't think I wanna think about this too much longer. Let's move on to the next one. Atlantis. Atlantis is a legendary city that was said to have been located in the Atlantic Ocean. According to stories written by the philosopher Plato, it was a utopian city that was advanced in technology and philosophical understanding for the time. However, the city was destroyed when it attempted to conquer ancient Athens, its rival and enemy. As a consequence of this attempted attack, the gods destroyed Atlantis and sunk the island and city into the depths of the ocean. It is interpreted by scholars to be an allegory of how the pride of a nation can lead to its downfall. Despite being a clear work of fiction, some have interpreted Plato's fictional tale as a reality, claiming that Atlantis is a real city that has been lost to time. Some cite plate tectonics as the culprit, and that Atlantis has simply been swallowed by the ocean in a manner that was unrelated to the gods. Despite countless efforts from hopeful people trying to prove otherwise, no evidence has been found that Atlantis was, in fact, a real city. So if it wasn't clear, these video segments that I'm doing right now and the narrations were recorded separately. I feel like I didn't convey my thoughts correctly in the narration, so I'm just kind of kind of rehash it a little bit right here. I don't necessarily think that Atlantis is a complete work of fiction. Rather, I think it was inspired by a real city that was located on an island. And, you know, that's where Plato got his idea for, you know, Atlantis. I don't know. We've never had any proof that Atlantis was real. So for the time being, I guess that's what I think of it. Uh, moving on. The Bermuda Triangle 
The Bermuda Triangle is a large region of the North Atlantic Ocean that has been associated with strange phenomena and the unexplained disappearances of both aircraft and ships. Incidents in the Triangle area have been traced back to the 1800s and continue to occur to this day. Some incidents within the area could be explained in a number of ways, including inclement weather and simple human error. Relatively recently, some have considered releases of methane hydrate to be the cause of some of the disappearances. This is because methane hydrate can cause a rapid loss of buoyancy in the ocean and can cause a ship to sink with little to no forewarning. One of the most notable incidents within the Triangle is the disappearance of the USS Cyclops, a collier ship that disappeared in March 4th of 1918. She was carrying a large amount of manganese ore which was bound for Baltimore, Maryland to be processed into munitions for World War I, which was ongoing at the time. During the ship's route north, it passed through the Bermuda Triangle and was never seen again. Interestingly, two of the Cyclops' sister ships, the Proteus and the Nereus, disappeared in the exact same manner as the Cyclops while sailing in around the same area. On a somewhat unrelated note, another one of the sister ships, known as the Jupiter, was converted into the USS Langley, which was the first American aircraft carrier. And on the topic of strange disappearances in the Bermuda Triangle... Flight 19 Flight 19 is perhaps the most famous disappearance case to be attributed to the Bermuda Triangle. On December 5, 1945, Flight 19 conducted a navigation training flight off the coast of Florida. The group consisted of five TBM Avenger torpedo bombers that had departed from NAS Fort Lauderdale. They were led by Lieutenant Charles Taylor, who had completed a combat tour in the Pacific. He was also an experienced pilot who had taught torpedo bombing at NAS Miami. After completing their training exercise and dropping their last bombs, Lieutenant Taylor reported over the radio to another flight of torpedo bombers on a similar exercise that they had lost track of where they were and required assistance to return to Fort Lauderdale. Taylor would say to the other flight leader, quote, Both of my compasses are out and I'm trying to find Fort Lauderdale, Florida. I'm over land, but it's broken. I'm sure I'm in the Keys, but I don't know how far down and I don't know how to get to Fort Lauderdale. It's likely from piecing together this series of events that Taylor mistook their surroundings and ultimately put the flight on an incorrect course back to base. It's believed that both the other TBM flight and naval personnel on shore were actively attempting to locate and assist Taylor in getting home by sending directional readings and other relevant information. Regardless of what information was relayed to the flight, Taylor would lead his crew on his charted course, which would ultimately lead him over 200 nautical miles out to sea. At least, this is where radio stations would estimate him to be. By this point, the weather had begun to deteriorate and the sun was close to setting. Radio contact had also begun to break up due to the weather, which proved to be very bad for Flight 19. About three hours after becoming lost, Flight 19 would make its last known radio transmission. Quote, All planes close up tight. We'll have to ditch unless landfall. When the first plane drops below 10 gallons, we'll go down together. Shortly after this, Flight 19 was declared lost and a search and rescue effort was launched. In addition to the five planes and the 14 total airmen, a Martin PBY Catalina and its 13 crew were also lost during the search. A little under two hours later, a tanker named the SS Gaines Mills reported seeing a sizable explosion at 28.59 degrees north and 80.25 degrees west. This explosion coincides with the Catalina's flight path and the loss of radar contact reported by the USS Solomons, an escort carrier that was participating in the search. It's unknown what could have caused the plane to suddenly explode. This loss has also been attributed by some to the Triangle due to its sudden and violent nature. Man oh man, when I was younger, man, I was in my Bermuda Triangle bag. I'm gonna be completely honest. I loved everything that had to do with the Bermuda Triangle. I was reading all the books, I was reading all of the online articles that I could find. And I guess, to a degree, there are some things in there that I just cannot explain, but yeah, I think that Flight 19 is pretty open and shut. 
the flight leader got a bad bearing and I'm not even really sure how he could have done that considering if they were navigating correctly before, you know, navigating the islands and all that, why they couldn't just reference their last known confirmed position and then fly back to Florida that way, I'm not sure. I'm not a pilot, I'm not a military pilot, you know, they they probably had different protocols they were following. I guess the loss of the compass is something that could be kind of weird or unexplainable, but then again, you know, that area is known for its inclement weather, you know, it's a hurricane hot spot, and I wouldn't be surprised if there were just some weather conditions there that were kind of throwing off magnetic signals, making the compass all weird. I guess it is a little strange though that after all these years, we haven't found Flight 19. It's almost comical, like the amount of TBM Avenger planes that they've found and claiming like, oh, this is Flight 19, this is Flight 19. No, that one's Flight 19. It's like they found so many different planes that are the same model and they all went missing in like the same area, but none of them have been Flight 19. Maybe it's a little morbid for me to make fun of that, but it's, it's just strange, man. I, I don't know. I guess that's why people are interested in the Bermuda Triangle, you know? If it was a benign place with a couple of missing ships under its belt, it wouldn't be that interesting, but we have events like this and that's what makes it interesting. So yeah, I guess moving on. The Roswell Incident In June of 1947, a New Mexican rancher named Mac Brazel was working on his farm field when he discovered a large amount of unknown debris. The debris ranged from a tinfoil-like metal to rubber pieces, as well as wooden beams. After believing it to be trash that blew onto his field, he gathered it up and put it into some brush to get rid of it. A short time later, Brazel heard about the ongoing flying saucer craze of 1947, in which silvery flying discs were being sighted all over the Pacific Northwest. Now believing the tinfoil-like metal to potentially be flying saucer debris, he brought some examples to the local sheriff's department, who in turn contacted the Roswell Army Airfield, who assigned Major Jesse Marcel to investigate. After gathering all the remaining debris from Brazel's field, Marcel would consult the base's chain of command for further advice. The situation eventually made its way to Fort Worth, Texas, where General Roger Ramey would request that the debris be flown to Fort Worth immediately for inspection. After the debris was sent away, a Roswell Army Airfield public information officer named Walter Hout relayed to the public that they'd recovered a flying disc. However, this statement was quickly retracted, with the narrative instead being that they'd recovered a crashed weather balloon. This sudden change in narrative is what forms the basis of the Roswell conspiracy, and has inspired many to question what the Army actually found that day. However, when you begin to take a more involved look into the Roswell incident conspiracies, you can start to see some cracks forming in the logic and reasoning behind them. For example, there are multiple pieces of information that supposedly come from first-hand accounts of Roswell that actually come from the Aztec New Mexico UFO incident, which was a similar event that happened about a year later. The Aztec incident was proven soon after its publishing in 1949 to be a hoax, but was also revived in the 1970s along with Roswell and many other UFO related incidents. Also at some point it was reported that the bodies of the ship's alien operators were also recovered by the military, which sensationalized the story even further. In 1994 it was concluded by an Air Force investigation that the debris from Roswell was actually from a nuclear surveillance balloon that was a part of Project Mogul. Project Mogul was conducted by the U.S. Air Force to listen for Soviet nuclear tests using balloons with highly sensitive microphones. Obviously, United States surveillance of Soviet weaponry was a very hot topic at the time, which is likely why the government was unwilling to disclose the debris's true identity. It also more or less goes without saying that the recovered alien bodies were completely unsubstantiated and potentially inspired from the use of parachute dummies in experimental aircraft. However, despite all of the evidence to the contrary, there are still many who call the Roswell incident proof that the government knows a bit more than it's letting on. So, kind of like Flight 19 in the Bermuda Triangle, I was at one point a Roswell 
nut, I guess is the only way that you can say it. You know, when I was in middle school, I was just all over this kind of stuff. You know, I was going through all of the CIA, FBI, FOIA documents. I just thought I was a little X-Files guy, a little, little Fox Mulder kind of thing. I Whatever. I'm getting nostalgic. I'm here to talk about Roswell. But yeah, I personally think that Roswell is just another case of sensationalization of stories. You know, a simple story, you know, a guy found a bunch of tinfoil debris in his field and he didn't know what it was, so he called the sheriff's office and the sheriff's office didn't know what it was, and so then they called the army and then everything escalated from there. And then you throw in a couple of details from some other stories that happen to relate to aliens as well, and you've pretty much got Roswell. There are just entire aspects of Roswell that have just been taken from other stories that I just can't call it credible. It's just kind of a mishmash of stuff. Am I 100% denying that the US military or the government has ever come into contact with flying saucers? No, not at all. There's plenty of cases in which that could have happened, but I just don't think Roswell is it. Anyways, I think we should move on. Amelia Earhart. Amelia Earhart is one of the most well-known figures in aviation history. She's famous for being the first woman to conduct a non-stop transatlantic flight and has become a role model for people in the aviation industry. After making a name for herself in the aviation industry by completing the aforementioned transatlantic flight, Earhart decided that she'd wish to make history once again. In 1937, she set out from Oakland, California to become the first woman to complete a circumnavigation of the world via airplane. Her original departure was not publicized, so she announced her intentions after reaching Miami, Florida. She would be making the flight in a modified Lockheed Electra E-10. The plane had just been serviced by Lockheed after being damaged in a previous circumnavigation attempt in the months prior. Accompanying her on the flight was an experienced navigator named Frederick Noonan, who commonly went by Fred. After departing from Miami, the pair flew much of their route without incident passing through South America, Africa, India, and Southeast Asia. The final stretch of their journey was over the open Pacific Ocean, which would begin at Leh, New Guinea. After departing from there, Earhart and Noonan made their way to their next stop, Howland Island. A U.S. Coast Guard cutter named Itasca was anchored at Howland Island to provide radio and navigational support for the travelers. In the early hours of the morning, communications began to exchange between the aircraft and the ship. Earhart would ask Itasca for a directional bearing at 6.14 a.m., likely due to a malfunction with her equipment. However, the radio operators on board Itasca realized that their RDF was unable to lock on to the plane's signals. She would repeat this same call at 6.45 a.m., but ultimately receive the same results from Itasca. Further attempts were made to establish a directional bearing, including exchanges of Morse code and whistles over the radio. However, nothing meaningful was relayed to either party. The Itasca also fired its oil-powered boilers to generate a great deal of smoke, but the flyers were unable to see it. Eventually, Earhart would broadcast her last known transmission at 8.43 a.m. Quote, We are on the line 157337. We will repeat this message. We will repeat this on 6210 kilocycles. Wait. Eventually, it was determined by the Itasca that Earhart and Noonan had bypassed the Howland Island area by means of a navigational error, and a search for the plane was undertaken. Unfortunately, rudimentary search and rescue techniques created flawed search patterns, with entire areas of ocean being overlooked based on erroneous information and hunches by the searchers. Many islands in the South Pacific were searched, with the hope that Earhart and Noonan had managed to crash near a piece of land, but to no avail. Searchers never found a substantiated piece of evidence in regards to Earhart or Noonan. This lack of evidence has led some to perpetuate theories surrounding their disappearance. Some claim that Earhart and Noonan could have been marooned on Gardner Island, a coral atoll that was within flying distance of their last known location. After being marooned, the pair would have survived for a while until they likely died of starvation or exposure. Afterwards, their bodies would have likely been eaten by the island's population of coconut crabs. 
While pre-World War II artifacts have been found on Gardner Island, they've not been linked to Earhart or Noonan in a reliable way. Another theory is that Earhart and Noonan were captured and executed by the Japanese. It's said that they were either shot down or crashed near the Marshall Islands or the island of Saipan. Perpetrators of this theory claim to know eyewitnesses who saw Japanese soldiers executing a woman and a man and tearing apart a large airplane before throwing everything into the ocean. However, none of these claims have stood up to any scrutiny. In 1939, Amelia Earhart was named as dead in absentia, as no substantial traces of her body or her plane were ever found. Her navigator, Fred Noonan, was declared in the same manner almost a year prior. To this day, nothing has been discovered about either aviator, and it remains an interesting mystery. I personally think that the case of Amelia Earhart is quite similar to that of Flight 19, in which the navigator for the flight, who was Fred Noonan as opposed to the flight leader in Flight 19, um, he just had a bad reading, a bad navigational reading, and they ended up flying past the point where they were supposed to land and refuel, and at some point they just kind of flew until they ran out of fuel and they crashed in the ocean never to be seen again. Anyways, I think we should move on to the next one. Live Leak. Live Leak is a well-known British video sharing site that was launched in 2006. More often than not, Live Leak was misconstrued as a shock site throughout its tenure on the internet, as much of the content on the site is inherently offensive in nature. However, the site was intended to foster a sense of legitimate journalism in its users by putting little restriction on what could be posted. Live Leak got its first big break in popularity when the videotaped execution of Iraqi dictator Saddam Hussein was leaked onto the site in 2007. From then on, Live Leak gained a reputation for hosting some of the most gruesome and horrific events available on the surface internet. Everything from animal maulings, industrial accidents, wartime footage, and street violence that sometimes involved children. Because of this, many media platforms took issue with Live Leak and its content policies and demanded that they take these videos down. When asked about whether or not these offensive videos would be removed, Co-founder Hayden Hewitt stated, quote, Look, this is all happening. This is real life, and this is going on, and we're going to have to show it. Live Leak would weather multiple controversies over the course of its existence, including its hosting of the anti-Quran film Fitna, and the appalling execution by beheading of American journalist James Foley at the hands of the Islamic State. It would remove these pieces of media at the request of the relevant parties. It also briefly hosted videos of the Christchurch mosque shootings in New Zealand in 2019. These videos were also taken down. In 2020, Live Leak would momentarily disable access to the site's hosted videos, instead suggesting videos from sites like Dailymotion or YouTube. Many took this as a sign that Live Leak was nearing the end of its rope, and they were not wrong. On May 5th, 2021, the site was officially shut down at the source. Some were glad to see the site gone, others were disappointed. If you try and type in the URL for Live Leak now, it will simply redirect you to Item Fix, which is a video sharing website with much stricter content policies. Ah, Live Leak. Uh, I have a lot of memories with Live Leak. Not sure if they're good or bad. I guess I'm still kind of figuring that out. I remember being in third grade and, um, I, story time, I guess. I would sneak my original iPhone. So I had like an original iPhone from 2007. That was my first phone. I would sneak that iPhone in my lunchbox to school. And then when it would come time for recess, we would, we being me and my friends, just watch videos basically on my iPhone. Um, and that was the first time I ever saw Live Leak. One of my friends suggested that I go and look up the site, you know, be like, oh, you know, I, I heard about this site, you know, Live Leak, it's got videos. It's like, oh, you know, cool, whatever. And it's like, 
I don't think as third graders we really knew what we were seeing, which, you know, I, I guess that's a good thing. I think the last time that I ever went on Live Leak was like my freshman year of high school. Now that it's gone, I'm not really sure how I feel about it, because like, I don't want to say that I'm like overjoyed that it's gone, or, and I don't want to say like I'm sad that it's gone, but I, I guess I'm just indifferent to it almost. Like, I don't know. Let's just move on. The Yeti. The Yeti is most often described as a large, ape-like creature that's covered in either brown, white, or gray fur. It's said to inhabit the extremely wide and tall Himalayan mountain range, and is elusive in nature. Stories and sightings of the Yeti go back thousands of years. The creature has been adopted into many tribal cultures and even Tibetan Buddhism. It's been depicted as a helper to religious figures and an enforcer of Dharma, as well as a guardian against evil spirits. Modern sightings of the Yeti began in the early 20th century, when Western explorers began to summit and explore most of the Himalayas. Dozens of expeditions and solo explorers would return home with stories and occasionally photographs of their findings. This would only further drive interest in the mysterious mountain giant, which would peak in the 1950s, coinciding with the first summiting of Mount Everest in 1953. Mountaineer Eric Shipton would take a photograph of a Yeti footprint in 1951 that would garner a great deal of attention from scientists and mountaineers alike. To this day, it remains one of the most credible and compelling pieces of photo evidence for believers of the Yeti, but also one of the more scrutinized. Also, famed Everest conquerors Edmund Hillary and Tenzig Norgay would report seeing large footprints in the snow during their 1953 ascent. However, both Hillary and Norgay would independently put in writing that they did not believe in the Yeti, and did not attribute their discovery of footprints to such a creature. In the 21st century, interest in the Yeti has remained, but is not nearly as captivating as it once was. In 2011, a panel of Russian scientists excitedly claimed that they had proof of the Yeti's existence. This proof was, however, circumstantial at best. Conference attendee Jeffrey Meldrum, an expert in primate morphology and locomotion, later concluded that their claims were nothing more than a publicity stunt and lacked credibility. I know I've said this a thousand times already, but like, I feel like creatures like the Yeti and the Loch Ness Monster and Bigfoot, I, I just feel like we should have found evidence of their existence already, if they were real. I guess the Yeti has the most leeway out of any of the ones that I've covered so far, because, I mean, let's be honest, the Himalayas are pretty uninhabitable, and when it comes to exploring them, I mean, you need to be a certain kind of person to just go hiking around the Himalayas looking for a Yeti, you know what I'm saying? Anyways, let's move on to the next one. The Phoenix Lights The Phoenix Lights were a UFO phenomenon that took place in the southwestern U.S., specifically the states of Arizona and Nevada. On March 13, 1997, an unidentified witness in Henderson, Nevada, reported seeing a V-shaped formation of lights moving through the sky at 7.55 p.m. Over the course of the night, many more witnesses would report seeing the same formation of lights moving at a decent speed through the sky. Sightings were then reported in Arizona, beginning in the town of Paulden, then in Prescott Valley, as well as Glendale and Scottsdale, which are a part of the Phoenix metropolitan area. In February of 2007, the lights briefly made a return to the skies of Arizona. Witnesses would call into their local news stations to report these sightings, and excitedly welcome the lights back after a decade of absence. However, excitement would be tempered by an official report from Luke Air Force Base, which claimed the lights were simply flares dropped from an F-16 out on a training exercise. The lights appeared in the media one more time, a little over a year later, on April 21, 2008. This time, the lights appeared at around 8 p.m. in a square formation while moving west, then changed into the well-known triangle formation shortly after. According to another witness, several military jets were then seen trailing after the formation. However, representatives from the nearby Luke Air Force Base have denied that any U.S. Air Force jets were out at the time of the sighting. 
The following day, a Phoenix resident would inform the local newspaper that a neighbor of theirs was responsible for last night's sighting of the lights. Apparently, they had launched helium-filled balloons from their backyard that were equipped with road flares. The following day, another anonymous resident would confirm that he was responsible for the lights, and described a similar process to the first report, which was enough evidence for authorities to close the investigation. I think a part of growing up, at least in my case, was realizing that not everything that is initially unexplainable or attributed to aliens is in fact unexplainable or attributable to aliens. And I think that the Phoenix Lights are a perfect example of this. I mean, just because a bunch of people saw something that they couldn't immediately explain doesn't mean that a bunch of aliens, you know, did a flyby over Phoenix. A little while after the lights became famous, it was revealed that they were more than likely just a formation of A-10 warthogs flying at high altitude as part of Operation Snowbird. Operation Snowbird was a special pilot training program that was run out of Davis Monthan Air Force Base in Tucson, Arizona. As part of Snowbird, the pilots would practice these high altitude maneuvers and, you know, dropping flares in an effort to avoid, you know, air to air missiles, you know, that kind of stuff. The planes were flying in an air corridor that was assigned to them by the FAA, and they were allowed to use solid formation lights rather than the blinking lights that we commonly associate with aircraft. This is probably the biggest source of confusion that people see, because they think of planes in the sky and being like, oh, you know, blinking lights, but these planes didn't have blinking lights. So kind of easy to mess up that distinction, I guess. The second appearance of the lights was also attributable to Snowbird, as I briefly mentioned there. The F-16s that dropped those flares were also a part of Snowbird, so it's very likely that the flares just kind of burned for a really long time. Apparently, somebody did some calculations and figured out that the burn length for the flares that F-16s drop was actually somewhat equivalent to the amount of time that people sighted them. I don't know. It's super confusing. You can go and look it up yourself. I, I don't know if I can explain it correctly here. Anyways, I think that was a sufficient enough explanation. Let's move on. Orphan work. Orphan work is defined as a piece of copyrighted material that possesses indeterminate or uncontactable rights holders. Essentially, the copyrighted material is unable to be licensed or used by anyone because the rights holders are not around to give consent. A piece of copyrighted material can become orphaned through the death or unexpected absence of a rights holder, a company going defunct or bankrupt, or a rights holder being simply unaware of their status or ownership. The amount of orphan works in the US and abroad has increased substantially since 1989, as copyright laws were altered to allow anonymous publishing. Thus, association of work is not required to be disclosed, and the work is automatically classed as being orphaned. To try and combat the growing problem, some countries have begun to create registries that classify orphan works and allow for people to request licenses from the government for these works. However, some of these systems have been relatively unsuccessful in categorizing orphan works due to one reason or another. In the EU specifically, their system has been criticized by many, citing that the unreasonably complex systems results in only a small amount of works being entered into the registry, which kind of defeats the whole purpose. The amount of orphan works worldwide is currently unknown, though a study conducted in 2009 showed that the public sector organizations in the UK alone possessed over 25 million individual orphan works. Computer software that has been orphaned by its rights holders also has its own category of classification, known as abandonware. Abandonware includes everything from old software that is no longer supported by its official creators, to old or unfinished video games. There have been some really cool efforts to try and categorize slash preserve pieces of abandonware, including the Internet Archive and the website Abandonia. These individual efforts have even resulted in a concerted effort from the U.S. Library of Congress, yes, the real Library of Congress, to preserve certain video games called the Game Canon, which started in 2006. Slenderman Slenderman is an extremely well-known creepypasta that was created by Eric Knudsen in 2009. 
It was the result of a Photoshop contest on the Something Awful website, a fairly popular internet forum at the time. It has inspired multiple video games, ARGs, movies, and documentaries throughout its tenure on the internet. Slenderman is described as an abnormally tall, pale, thin man in a black suit, paired with a black or red tie. His trademark feature is his lack of any discerning facial features, instead sporting a smooth, detailless face that can be quite eerie to look at. He can also be seen adorned with long black tentacles that protrude from his back or other parts of his body. While the tale of Slenderman is obviously fictional, there have been some very real and tragic events associated with the creepypasta. On May 31st, 2014, two 12 year old girls named Anissa Ware and Morgan Geyser would lure their friend, Peyton Lutner into the woods of Waukesha, Wisconsin during a game of hide-and-seek. There, the two girls would attack Lutner and stab her 19 times, and ultimately leave her for dead. Unfortunately for her attackers, Lutner would survive and crawl to a nearby road where she was found by a biker who would dial 911 and bring her to the hospital for treatment. About five hours later, Wire and Geyser were found in a furniture store off of I-94, about five miles from where the attack took place. The knife that they used was found in one of their bags. When authorities questioned the two girls, they were shocked to learn about their motivations for the attempted homicide. According to the girls, the stabbing was meant to appease Slenderman, who had apparently left them with no choice but to kill their friend. Otherwise, their families could be put at risk of being killed. After the deed had been done, Wire and Geyser were to walk to Slenderman's residence, aptly named Slender Mansion, in the Nicolette National Forest, which was over 200 miles from Waukesha. Geyser appeared to show no empathy for her acts, while Wire had shown guilt for her part in the attempted murder. Both girls were arrested and evaluated by psychiatrists, which, unsurprisingly, determined that both girls suffered from mental illness, with Geyser being the more troubling diagnosis of the two. She was confirmed to have early-onset childhood schizophrenia, an illness she likely inherited from her father, who was also a schizophrenic. Her illness, which had been left untreated for some time, caused her to have vivid hallucinations from time to time ultimately culminating in the months prior when she began to receive messages from Slenderman, who told her to kill someone to appease him. After she was arrested, Geyser's mother stated that she became floridly psychotic. She would talk to herself for great periods of time, claim to see unicorns run past her, and would hold regular conversations with both Slenderman and Severus Snape, a character from the popular book series Harry Potter. In 2017, both Wire and Geyser were found not guilty of the stabbing for reasons of mental disease or defect. Instead, they were committed to the Winnebago Mental Institute for treatment of their mental illness. Wire was given a sentence of 25 years to life, ultimately dependent on how well she responded to treatment. Geyser was given the maximum sentence at 40 years to life. She will remain in custody until symptoms of her illness abate as well as undergo regular re-evaluation as her providers see fit. As of today, Peyton Lutner is alive and well, and is pursuing a career in medicine. Anissa Wire was released in 2021 with multiple stipulations, including 24-hour GPS tracking and internet monitoring. Morgan Geyser, however, is still committed to the Winnebago Mental Institute, and will likely remain there for the foreseeable future. Yeah, man, that was pretty heavy. Um, that just kind of makes me think back to my own experiences with like creepy pastas and like, you know, internet stories and whatnot, because I used to be really into that stuff as well. I guess I still am to a degree. I mean, not to the extent that I'm like these people, but like I was pretty deep into it, you know, me and my friends. We'd all, you know, be in the playground, you know, having all these talks, making up stories in our heads. We had this whole like 
storyline thing that we all just contributed to and it makes you think back on on all the stuff that you used to think about and talk about with your friends and I, I guess it makes you question whether or not like it was too much I mean in the case with uh, wire and geyser you know that's pretty heavy what they did I mean they took the stories and everything to just the absolute extreme and they ended up actually hurting someone very severely over it. I, I guess it's not the same, you know. I, I don't have any diagnosed mental health conditions, none of my friends do either. To think about how we took it, you know, and, and how these people took it, and it's just the differences, man. I, you know, my condolences to everybody involved, you know, I really hope everybody moved past this. It seems like uh, Lutner made past everything okay, and, and she's doing well. And I hope that both Wire and Geyser are eventually able to overcome whatever possessed them back then. It seems like Wire's having a, an easier time of it than Geyser, but, you know, regardless, I hope both of them uh, get the help that they need and, and, and get past this, genuinely. Alright, I think we should move on to the next one. Malaysian Airlines Flight 370 Malaysian Airlines Flight 370, also abbreviated as MH370, was a Boeing 777 that disappeared on March 8, 2014 during a flight from Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia to Beijing, China. On board, she carried 227 passengers and 12 crew, for a total of 239 occupants. The flight plan dictated that MH370 would cross the South China Sea in the northeast, briefly flying over Vietnam until finally crossing over mainland China while en route to Beijing. Instead of following this plan, however, the plane would make a severe course correction less than an hour after takeoff. The plane would make a very sharp, sudden U-turn that would bring their course back over Malaysia. The plane would continue to fly over Malaysia, eventually reaching the west coast by the island of Penang. The plane then made a subtle curve around the island, and then adjusted its path to the northwest, and began flying into the Andaman Sea and, potentially, the wider Indian Ocean. Soon after, land radar would lose contact with MH370. A few hours after the plane failed to land in Beijing, MH370 was declared missing and a search was launched. China and Australia would assist Malaysia in the initial search. For over a month, military aircraft and boats combed the waters near Malaysia, eventually expanding the search as far south as the coast of Australia. Eventually, the implied and obvious fate of MH370 began to show itself. In 2015, pieces of the aircraft would be recovered at the island of Reunion in the western Indian Ocean. This discovery is consistent with debris dispersal patterns that placed MH370's crash site in the Indian Ocean, which initially gave investigators hope that they would find something soon. However, nothing would turn up. The official search would be suspended in January of 2017 after three years citing a lack of evidence and an ever-growing budget to continue surveying for debris. While it would be restarted in 2018 by the private firm Ocean Infinity, it would end in the same year due to a lack of evidence and complications with the weather. Recently, there has been talk of Ocean Infinity restarting its search in the wake of new evidence that has not been disclosed to the public. Man, I think this is the first one on the iceberg that I legitimately do not have a logical explanation for. Like, every aspect of MH370 is just, it's so strange, you know? Like, why did the pilot just suddenly turn in the middle of the flight path, you know? And even, like, some stuff like the altimeter data that they're apparently claiming is just, like, forged because there's no way that the plane could have, like, dipped and dived so crazy. I think at one point they dropped like more than like five figures of height and just straight down and then like they came back up. It's weird. I'm gonna have to find a graphic to show you on screen because I'm probably not doing a great job explaining it right here. Yeah, man, there's just so many aspects of this case that are just like, it's like, how, how do you even explain something like this? Why would the pilot just turn in the middle of the course? 
Where did the plane end up? Can anybody really be blamed for this? Like, you know, we, we just, we don't know enough of anything really to, to make a solid case because we don't really have anything. We don't have the flight data recorder. We don't have any, you know, communications coming out of the plane. It's just the plane suddenly did a turn and then we never saw it again. I hope when they eventually find the plane that we're able to get some kind of closure regarding, you know, what happened there because I'm just, I I'm so mesmerized by what potentially could have happened because there's just so much that could have. Anyways, I think we should move on now because if I keep talking about this, my brain's just gonna go numb. Alien abductions. Alien abductions are when someone is kidnapped or forcibly moved by an alien figure. Typically, these abduction scenarios involve some kind of a forced physical or psychological experiment being performed on the abductee or experiencer, as they have come to be called. On many occasions, these experiments will involve focus on the reproductive organs, or even, and I know this sounds crazy, interspecies breeding. Uh, do with that revelation what you will. In some cases, abductions can take on a more forewarning aspect, with abductees being warned about the state of the world, the dangers of nuclear weapons, and the rapid deterioration of the environment. Time loss is also another prevalent aspect of abduction cases, with abductees often reporting that their conscious perception of time does not line up with how much time has passed in the real world. Lost time can range anywhere from a few hours to, in the most extreme cases, a few days. While the abduction phenomenon is apparent all over the world, it is most commonly found in English-speaking countries, namely the United States. The first abduction story to gain a great deal of attention was the Barney and Betty Hill case, which occurred in 1961 in the state of New Hampshire. Reports state that the husband and wife had been driving along US Route 3, returning to Portsmouth, New Hampshire from a vacation when they observed a strange craft adorned with multicolored lights. The craft moved erratically in the sky, with sudden and strange movements that defied logic. Eventually, the craft would intercept the car on the highway, deploying a large structure from the bottom of the craft that would produce 8 to 11 humanoid figures wearing black uniforms and caps. At some point, their memories become hazy and fragmented, unable to remember what happened after seeing the figures. Eventually, they found themselves back in their car well on their way home to Portsmouth. After arriving home, the Hills discovered that some of their clothing and belongings had been damaged. Their watches were damaged beyond repair, and they felt strange compulsions to check their genitals and bodies for damage they did not find anything. Even more interesting is that they had arrived much later than they'd anticipated, with nearly seven hours passing since their departure for home, when it should have only taken about four hours. That meant there were about three hours of time that neither could account for, that was just straight missing from both of their recollections. It's these kinds of unexplainable events that make alien abductions as interesting as they are, at least in my opinion. However, there are some factors that we need to consider before taking these accounts at face value. For one, many abduction stories appear to be influenced in some way by the home culture of the abductee, incorporating aspects or details that are difficult to replicate in other abduction stories. For example, an abduction story in Brazil is nigh unrecognizable when compared to an abduction story from the US. If both abductions were carried out by a similar entity, it would be expected that at least a few specific details would overlap, but they hardly ever do. While one could argue that there are in fact different extraterrestrial entities performing these procedures in different parts of the world, I still think that this is worth bringing up. Also, there have been many cases in which a purported abductee has experienced signs of mental illness in their life. This immediately discredits their description of events in most people's eyes, as it could potentially be chalked up to their illness simply playing a cruel trick on them. There have also been examples of people faking abduction stories for attention, which also draws credit away from the phenomena if anybody can concoct a story of how they were whisked away by an alien in a spaceship. 
It's these kinds of factors that can make it difficult to distinguish what's real and what's fake, and ultimately keeps alien abductions in the widely accepted realm of science fiction. The Protocols of the Elders of Zion The Protocols of the Elders of Zion is supposedly an authentic manuscript that details a plan of Jewish global domination. It is unknown who originally created the manuscript or when it was originally written, but it was first published in Russia in 1903 and was internationally distributed in multiple languages soon after. While appearing to be a proper, well-researched manuscript on the surface, a brief analysis will immediately show its glaring problems. First, important parts of the manuscript are clearly plagiarized from other publications, namely Maurice Jolie's The Dialogue in Hell between Machiavelli and Montesicu. I think that's how you say that. It also borrowed elements from the writings of Hermann Goetsch, who wrote poorly informed novels about Jewish conspiracies after being dismissed from the Prussian secret police for forging evidence during an investigation. The protocols also make very few focused points regarding the intentions of the Jewish elders, other than that they seek world domination and control. Also, it makes little attempt to actually connect any of these supposed intentions to any specific Jewish people or organizations. It just kind of loosely implies that if given the chance, Jewish people would employ these tactics to take over the globe. This does partially work to its advantage, however, as it allows the protocols to be embraced by all facets of anti-Semitism, from rich to poor, right to left, and religions and races of all kinds. Unsurprisingly, given the subject matter, the protocols were picked up by the Nazis in 1933, and even assigned to children in schools as factual scholarly texts. There are theories that the protocols influenced a great deal of Adolf Hitler's policies about Jewish people, but these theories are little more than unsubstantiated claims. While he did mention the protocols in his autobiography Mein Kampf and defends their factuality, it's no evidence that it caused him to take such a radical stance. From what I and others can see, his hate and contempt for Jewish people was present and realized long before he first came into contact with the manuscript. Despite being proven as a fraudulent document by multiple outlets by even the mid-1920s, the protocols continued to be a popular piece of anti-Semitic material, being distributed all over the world and giving way to more and more hate wherever it has unfortunately landed. So I, for one, had never actually heard of the Protocols of Zion before researching for this, but apparently it's like a super well-known piece of anti-Semitic literature. College classes will apparently like give it as like, you know, study points and whatnot, and I guess I was surprised I'd never heard of it before. And I guess the only reason I'm putting it at number one is because apparently everybody knows about this, but I never did, you know, my parents never heard about it, none of my friends knew about it. I mean, I've even talked to a couple of Jewish people and some of them didn't even know what it was. So if you've heard of the protocols before, like drop a comment and like let me know where you heard about it from because I've just never heard about this. Oh, of course, if you start barking. Anyways, let's go ahead and move on to the next one. Dog, quit it! I swear. Yeah, moving on. Potato Sack. The Potato Sack was an ARG that was created by game developer Valve to promote the release of the highly anticipated Portal 2 on their gaming platform, Steam. Starting on April 1st, 2011, the Potato Sack Bundle was released to the Steam Store, which contained 13 seemingly unrelated indie games at a significant 75% discount. However, players would discover that all of the games within this bundle had received an update that pertained in some way to potatoes. As gamers would come to figure out, these updates all seemed to play into a wider purpose, and change the games in small but interesting ways. Many of the assets added to the game contained special glyphs, which in turn pointed to ciphers for the community to solve. The bundled games would receive two subsequent updates, each adding more complicated puzzles and ciphers for the players to solve. These puzzles and ciphers involved pictures and audio elements as well, 
and were shown to players on a fictional Aperture Science website, which contained sealed archives for players to open. Some of the material that was unveiled by the ARG was concept art for Portal 2, as well as some lore. As players progressed through the ARG and accessed materials related to it, they would earn potatoes that would contribute to a special badge that was displayable on their Steam profile. Towards the end of the ARG, players became aware of a page on the Aperture Science website titled GLaDOS at Home, GLaDOS being the antagonist from the first Portal game, and the reported antagonist of the second. This page acted as a distributed computing program, which relied on the player's computers to complete a task outlined by the ARG, create enough CPU cycles by playing the games within the Potato Sack bundle, and GLaDOS would reboot earlier than expected. This suggested to players that completing the ARG would result in an earlier release date for Portal 2. After pulling together and creating a system to maximize the amount of cycles generated, the player base ultimately unlocked Portal 2 a full 10 hours ahead of schedule. Also, around 1,800 players received all 36 possible potatoes for completing tasks during the ARG. Their reward was an exclusive Golden Potato Badge for their Steam profile, as well as the Valve Complete Pack, which consisted of all of Valve's original IPs on Steam, including the notorious Half-Life series and, of course, Portal 2. Family Gathering Family Gathering is an infamous photograph that has a fascinating story attached to it. As the story goes, the Cooper family bought an old house in the state of Texas in the 1950s. To commemorate their arrival in the new home, Mr. Cooper took a family photo of his mother, two sons, and his wife seated at the dinner table. Everyone was in good spirits and excited to be moved in. A short time later, probably after taking some more photos, Mr. Cooper would take the camera's roll of film to the local pharmacy to have it developed. He was told it would take a week to develop the photos, which was not an uncommon amount of time to wait in the 1950s. When Mr. Cooper retrieved the photos a week later, he discovered that something strange had happened to the photo of his family at the table. On the left side of the photo, there was what appeared to be a body hanging from the ceiling, with its arms stretched towards the floor. It appears to be wearing some kind of white clothing, and has a distorted and obscured face. This was, understandably, quite unnerving for Mr. Cooper. The body had obviously not been there when he took the photo, nor had anyone made any comments referencing anything strange happening that night. Decades later, in 2009, the picture found its way onto the internet on the forum Thomas Ligotti Online. Here, it was given the somewhat innocuous, but ominous title of Family Gathering. Over the years, people have made claims to its authenticity, and how it could be a fake or an accident that appears paranormal in nature. One common explanation is double exposure, in which two picture exposures are combined together in one image. The upside down figure and distortion could have been the result of Mr. Cooper dropping the camera and accidentally taking a photo. However, Mr. Cooper, nor any of his relatives, have been found for comment on the photo meaning we may never know the backstory behind this interesting photo. Annabelle Annabelle is a purportedly possessed Raggedy Ann doll that was discovered in 1971 by an unknown woman. According to the former owner, her mother gifted her the doll while she was going through nursing school. Shortly after receiving it, she started to notice that strange things would happen around her house the doll would randomly change positions, and distressing notes would appear around the house, reading, Help me, or help us. Her roommate at the time would also corroborate these events. This would prompt the pair to seek out a medium, who in turn informed them that the doll was attached to the spirit of a young girl named Annabelle. Believing they could coexist and potentially nurture the spirit, the roommates made an effort to accept Annabelle into their home and their lives. However, the doll appeared to reject these efforts and reacted with malicious behavior towards the two women. Reportedly, it even attacked a friend of theirs, leaving behind claw marks that drew blood. Deciding they could not live with the doll any longer, they would contact paranormal investigators Ed and Lorraine Warren, 
who would then take the doll off their hands and place it in their occult museum. The doll would remain there in a glass case until the museum's closing in 2019. It's unknown what happened to Annabelle, nor the thousands of other paranormal artifacts within the museum. So in researching for this entry on the iceberg, I learned a lot about Ed and Lorraine Warren, who are the people that uh, currently own Annabelle, um, or owned at one point, I guess. Apparently, the Warrens have a really long history of, like, hamming up stories and kind of doctoring stuff to make it seem more scary or paranormal than it actually was. And there are a lot of people who think that Annabelle is one of those cases. I will admit, though, I am just slightly disappointed that the Occult Museum is closed. Um, I, I figured that out when I was researching for this. I mean, I always kind of wanted to visit there, you know, just to, like, see what was up. Because, I mean, at the end of the day, they did still have a lot of paranormal artifacts, and even if it's all fake, you know, I, I, I like to see that kind of stuff, you know, and hear the stories behind them. Because even if it wasn't real and it's just fiction, you know, it still took a lot of time to probably come up with those stories, and I can appreciate a good story. I think a lot of people can. So, yeah, I think we're going to move on now um, to the next one. Area 51 Area 51 is a classified U.S. Air Force facility deep in the Nevada desert. It's found itself at the center of a great deal of conspiracy and controversy due to its sensitive and secretive nature. Specifically, these controversies have to do with advanced technologies that the facility supposedly harbors. These technologies could include advanced weapons, weather controllers, teleportation and or cloaking devices, and most famously, extraterrestrial spacecraft and their biological occupants, which are studied on site to create advanced air and spacecraft, as well as biological agents for potential use in warfare and or genetic enhancement. Alright, time for potentially my least based claim of this entire iceberg. Um, I have a rock solid um, belief that there's just, there's nothing important at Area 51. <laughs> nothing at all. I mean, seriously. The amount of scrutiny that Area 51 gets nowadays, I mean, like, it's practically a gold mine for conspiracy theorists. And in my personal opinion, I think it would be borderline irresponsible of the Air Force to hold any kind of secret technology there with the amount of scrutiny that it gets. It just doesn't make sense, you know? Because even with the whole, like, Storm Area 51 meme, you know, that was almost like a real thing. And imagine if all of those people invaded that facility and that be the reason that aliens were confirmed as existing because you put all your eggs into a basket that everybody could see you know what i'm saying in my opinion if the government or the military is really in possession of alien bodies or alien technology they wouldn't put it in area 51 they probably put it in some clandestine facility that is either way less public than area 51 or is just not public at all, you know, kind of like what Area 51 used to be. But yeah, I, I really don't think there's anything there, and I think I've already given Area 51 a bit more time than necessary, so we're gonna move on. Liminal Space Liminal space is an aesthetic that is most easily described as an eerie, surreal space that can have a strong sense of nostalgia attached to it. Oftentimes, viewers of liminal space photos or videos will feel like they've been to the location depicted, but will also acknowledge that they've never been there in their life. Certain studies of liminal space cites this feeling stemming from the observed location lacking its perceived context. For example, this photo of an empty mini golf course may elicit a sense of eeriness or nostalgia. The same thing with this photo of an empty mall. We expect these areas to be full of people, milling around and doing something in this space, but there is no one. Without that perceived context, a space becomes nothing more than a visual catalyst for a heavy pit in our stomachs. Yeah, so probably not a super uncommon opinion here, but I, I love 
liminal space stuff. I just, I can't get enough of it. I feel like if there's like a meter or like a, a scale for how triggered somebody gets from liminal space, like I'm at like the top, you know, like most triggered by liminal space. The ones that especially get me are the ones of like the abandoned play places. Those just get me right there for some reason. I, I don't know why. I've only been in like a couple of play areas in my life um, and usually all of them were either at like a McDonald's or a Chuck E. Cheese, but next entry is also related to liminal space, um, so I'm just gonna pick it up there when I start talking about that, so enjoy. The Back Rooms the Back Rooms is an extremely popular example of the liminal space aesthetic. Initially created on 4chan in 2019 by an anonymous user, The Back Rooms has grown from a niche creepypasta into an internet-spanning phenomenon. The Back Rooms is most popularly depicted as an endless swath of interconnecting rooms, decorated with golden shag carpet and intricate but monotonous wallpaper which is in turn lit by yellow fluorescent lights. However, the back rooms have taken on many different creative forms in recent years, called levels by their creators, meant to illustrate a hierarchy or order in this strange, out-of-bounds world. Some levels depict something similar to an arcade or a long network of maintenance tunnels or even an apartment building. Some even depart from the artificial, closed perspective entirely choosing to fill the hallways or tunnels with trees and grass or incorporate open areas. The backrooms have also developed independent lore and timelines, which are created and managed by communities or individuals. Some popular examples include Kane Pixel's video, The Backrooms Found Footage, which has garnered 51 million views since its release a year ago, as well as r slash backrooms on Reddit. As far as internet creations go, I really, really like the back rooms. It's probably because it has to do with like liminal space and like I previously said, I just love liminal space stuff. But like the fact that so many people can like come together and like equally appreciate something for like how it is and, and how it can potentially work. I, I just, I really like that, you know? I guess that just kind of comes from, like, my love of internet fandoms and whatnot. Like, just a bunch of people coming together and collaborating on something. I, I love that stuff, you know? And The Backrooms is a prime example of that. Kind of two of my interests, you know, meshing together and creating something really cool, you know? And I also really like the lore aspects of The Backrooms, you know? How it's, like, this weird, like you know, alternate universe that, like, the government discovered, and you've got, like, the weird, you know, people going through in the suits, and then them finding, like, the pixel creatures, and it, I, I, I love it to death, what can I say? Anyways, I think I've gushed over the back rooms in liminal space long enough, let's just, let, let's move on. Flat Earth Theory Flat Earth Theory is exactly what it sounds like. An intense belief that the Earth is a large, flat surface, rather than a sphere. Despite the overwhelming evidence to the contrary, there are still a shocking amount of people who say the Earth is flat and say it proud. Yeah, I think a lot of the purveyors of flat Earth theory, they just have severe trust issues. I mean, just like down to the core, like that's what's wrong with them, it's just like they cannot trust anything from other other people or like stuff that they can't like immediately explain i also feel like flat earthers and people who like convey these like really like nonsensical theories and whatnot they have a mental process that is extremely similar to like ancient humans that like they don't really trust a lot of like what's around them and the only way that they can kind of like be sure of stuff is if they can see it. You know, inherently from, you know, just looking around at stuff, you know, the world is, you know, flat, you know, there's, it's, it's a flat plane that we're kind of like standing on, but you know, thanks to gravity and physics and everything, we know that the, well, the world is actually round, you know, it's a sphere and that's, you know, gravity is making us feel like we're on a flat surface. 
but because you don't have like an immediate understanding of the fact that you're on a sphere and, and, and flat earthers are kind of in the experience of like, well, if I can't see it, then I don't believe it. If they can't explain it easily, then they just go to the simplest answer, which is like, we're on flat ground, so the earth must be flat, you know? But we obviously know that like, you know, it's all about physics and gravity, and that's what's kind of making everything appear flat, like we're on a flat surface, but like we're actually on a sphere. And flat earthers can't grasp that concept because they also don't want to learn about, you know, round earth and how that stuff works because they have trust issues. They don't want to hear the information from someone else because like, oh, they're just in on it. It's like, I I'm also thinking about this video that I watched. It was like a flat earther scientist who like tried to, I guess, confirm that like the earth was flat and he had this experiment lined up about like how, oh, if the horizon works like this, then we'll just see it straight through and then I'll I'll prove that the Earth is flat, and then he ends up just proving his own point completely wrong, and he just goes into, like, a deadlock. It's kind of... It screwed up a little bit, because, like, the guy's clearly having, like, a hard time grasping why his theory isn't working, because it's wrong, but, like, I, I don't know, man. It's just kind of weird to know that there are people like that, and that they just... They can't trust what they can't see, you know? Anyways, I feel like I'm starting to ramble here, so let's just move on. Reptilians. Reptilians are a supposed race of large, reptile-esque creatures that have garnered a great deal of niche attention in the last few decades. According to some conspiracy theorists, reptilians have been present on Earth since the early days of civilization and have been influencing events around the world to their benefit. The most popular purveyor of reptilians and their associated theories is David Ickes, who's made a living publishing his thoughts about reptilians since 1999. According to him, the reptilians are tall, blood-drinking shapeshifters who arrived on Earth from the Alpha Draconis star system. In the present day, these reptilians now live in large underground bases, and have infiltrated every aspect of modern life in a conspiracy plan to bring humanity to its knees. He additionally believes that many of humanity's ancient and modern leaders, as well as important families, are actually reptilians in disguise. He specifically names the Merovingian dynasty and the royal family, as well as the Bush and Rothschild families as being reptilians. <sighs> yeah, man, I, I don't even know what I'm supposed to say. I don't know if I'm supposed to even say anything, you know? It's just like, reptilians, you know? They're tall, blood drinking, they came from the Alpha Dracona star system, they're living in underground bases. I don't know, it's it's like David Ickes showed up to like a creative writing class and just wrote like the worst possible like creature that he could and he put it into his theories about like how the world is running. It's comically evil. I guess is what I'm trying to say. And that's primarily the reason why I don't believe in it. I've read over, I shouldn't say read over, I've skimmed a couple of David Ickes's like books and whatnot, and I don't see the proof that he's offering to like make me believe in this. He's just kind of presenting his word and I'm supposed to just take it. I guess we're just gonna move on because I don't, I don't know what else to say, frankly. Vampires Vampires are mythical creatures that subsist on the blood of living creatures or humans. Historically, vampires are depicted as undead creatures with a bloated, dirty body and a dark, expressionless face. In the modern day, however, vampires are often depicted as gaunt, pale, and charismatic creatures with an elegant and violent agenda to back it up. Other cultures in southeastern Europe have been known to have their own form of vampires or vampire-like creatures, with Striga in Albania, Strigolis in Romania, and... Oh, I am so sorry if I butcher this word. Um, Vrykolikas? Vrykolikas? In Greece. I will put up the correct pronunciation if I screwed it up. Sorry. 
Yeah, vampires are kind of a tricky thing for me because I think this has probably already come across effectively, but I'm a very evidence-oriented person. I need a lot of proof of something before I can start to believe. Generally, word of mouth and just like stories and, you know, mythos about stuff like, you know, vampires and, and other creatures like that, I guess, um, they're not enough for me um, to believe. However, I think it was uh, Windigoon who brought up a really good point, in my opinion, that like, when you see like, confirmed vampires being like, buried in a cemetery, you know, with like, iron stakes through the chest, and all of this stuff being done to them and being buried a specific way, the people who did that to the person, they probably had to have seen something that made them want to do that. I'm not quite sure what video it was from, I'll probably put it on screen right now, um, and like maybe add a timestamp to where he said it. But yeah, I mean, those are the kind of things that we'll just kind of never know for sure because, you know, obviously the people who committed to, you know, doing that to somebody who they believe to be a vampire, uh, they're dead, you know, they're long dead. So we'll never actually understand their reasoning or know what the person did to deserve that kind of a ritualistic, you know, death, I guess. I I'm not sure. Yeah, I think we're going to go ahead and move on to the next one. Microplastics Microplastics are defined by NOAA as any piece of plastic that is less than 5 millimeters in length. Over the course of human advancement, the use of plastic items has increased significantly. In tandem with this increase, the amount of plastic that enters the environment has shot up as well. For a while, this blatant disregard of our species' waste has been allowed to build up, and we are only now beginning to find out the consequences in the form of climate change and microplastics. In 2019, the EU's scientific advancement mechanism determined that microplastics were present in every part of the environment on Earth. This includes the soil, oceans, freshwater sources, the air we breathe, the food we eat, and perhaps most disturbing, the creatures living in said environment, which includes humans. When looking at animals, the figures are nothing to make light of. Birds are consistently harmed by plastics, even to the point that a new disease was identified in captured specimens, induced by ingestion of plastic. Called plasticosis, it causes deformation and scarring in the intestinal tract, which impedes their ability to digest food properly. Ocean-dwelling creatures are also heavily affected by plastics in general, Everything from fish, crustaceans, bivalves, to coral, and even plankton are damaged by exposure. Consequences range from clogged gills and impaired neural function, to reproductive issues and oxidative stress in their internal systems. Things get personal and terrifying, however, when we start to look at microplastics in humans. Studies conducted in 2022 found that 11 out of 13 participants had microplastics in their lungs. Even more unnerving, 18 out of 22 anonymous donors had microplastics present in their blood. In other examinations, doctors have discovered microplastics in the breast milk of expecting mothers, and even the placenta of unborn fetuses. It has also been theorized that certain plastics with a similar makeup to estrogen could potentially replace it in the body, leading to biological complications we haven't even begun to consider. Yeah man, I think out of everything that we've covered so far, microplastics is potentially one of just the scariest for me at least. The fact that something can just incorporate itself into every aspect of our environment, breathing it in, like, that's, that's the thing that creeps me out the most, is that, like, plastic can, like, get into our bodies, and it just becomes a part of us. I think there was, like, a statistic out there that, like, every week or so, we get, like, a credit card's worth of plastic in our body, which just, like, oh, I, I don't even want to think about that, man. Like, like, a credit card? Like, grinding up a credit card in a blender and, like, putting that in your body. Like, that's just... Man, I, I don't even know how to think about that. 
Gosh, I'm gonna I'm gonna have a hard time sleeping tonight, I think. Anyways, I think we're gonna move on now. The Deep and Dark Web The deep or dark web is a portion of the internet that is not indexed by standard search engines, which is known as the surface web. To access this part of the internet, you must use a specialized browser that is capable of onion routing, the most popular example being Tor. At first glance, the deep web can be twisted as an extremely dark and dangerous place to browse. In reality, however, the deep web is mostly made up of junk websites and unlisted media that can't be indexed because they are incomplete. These sites, while hidden from the surface web, are more often than not boring and uninteresting pages that can range from a mostly blank page filled with gibberish to a personal blog that was just never published. Now, that's not to say that there aren't some truly useful or unique sites on the deep web. There are websites like HiddenWiki and Haystack, which index cool websites to make them easier to find. There are also anonymous communication websites that allow people to communicate regardless of internet restrictions, making cross-nation communication quite simple. These communication sites can also be super useful for journalists who may be living in a nation that has compromised internet access. There are also some more practical sites like Sci-Hub and the Imperial Library, which provide free access to countless books and official publications that are normally locked behind a payment. In a more obvious distinction, the dark web is the seedier area of the internet that is warned about in wider media. Here, you're more likely to discover disturbing and potentially illegal activities as you browse. Things that you may encounter include dark web markets, the results of ransomware attacks, dark web social media sites, as well as illicit pornography. However, many of the more shocking aspects of the dark web are monitored by authorities worldwide and are taken down if it is deemed necessary, as it so often is. Yeah, so I've been on the deep web a couple of times in my life, and it's honestly not a whole lot to get worked up about. I mean, the places that I was visiting at least, a lot of it was just, you know, junk websites. Occasionally I'd stumble across, like, I don't know, a gore website, and it's like, yeah, you know, there's, there's some icky images and whatnot, it, it makes you a little grossed out, but that's really it. A lot of the times, the stuff that's like, you know, the really illegal stuff that everybody's so concerned about, you know, the drug websites, the gun websites, you know, going and getting mass amounts of data, porn, all that stuff. Usually you have to have an in to go to those sites, like you have to know someone beforehand who knows the link from another person, and then you have... I don't know, man. I've never really screwed with that part of the internet, and I don't really think you should either, unless you're absolutely 100% sure of what you're getting yourself into. Um, but yeah, I guess that's my two cents about the dark web, uh, in the deep web. You know, I guess go in at your own peril, is what I'm trying to say. Um, yeah, moving on. Shared Hallucinations Shared hallucinations, which are medically referred to as shared delusional disorders, is when one individual, known as an inducer, experiences a delusional belief or hallucination, which is then transferred to another person after prolonged exposure and close proximity. The delusion is capable of spreading to more than two people and has been observed to spread as potentially as far as five people. The causes of shared hallucinations are not so much a specific thing but rather an array of criteria that could culminate in hallucination spreading. High levels of stress and social isolation in the subjects are significant contributors, with mental illnesses like schizophrenia also able to play a role in creating a shared experience. The type and severity of the hallucination can also be influenced by the mood the inducer is in. For example, a person who is paranoid or nervous may be more likely to experience the delusion of being stalked or followed around. If this delusion continues to the point at which it becomes a shared experience, those affected will experience the same level of paranoia and nervousness that the inducer experiences. I, I find the concept of shared hallucinations to just be so wacky, 
you know what I'm saying? Like, you can go from being like a perfectly sane, you know, normal person, you know, you live with someone who's crazy, but that's whatever. You go from just being perfectly normal and adjusted to just being like... There are people in the walls. <laughs> no, no, that's... It's also been said by a couple of people that the Slenderman stabbings, which I mentioned previously, um, that was a case of shared hallucination. And I'd have to agree with them, you know, because Geyser was having, you know, episodes, you know, had schizophrenia, all this stuff. And then here comes Wire, who's also, you know, kind of a little bit crazy, but like not to the degree that she's like idolizing killing people like Geyser. And because of that, it's like she was a bit more susceptible to that shared hallucination and they both kind of came to the realization that like we need to kill somebody for slender man um which that's just it's so fascinating to me how the human mind can just develop a situation just out of thin air they can just grab something and the mind can just put two and two together like that and then all of a sudden you know people around you are acting crazy too even when it was just you. I'm, I'm gonna have to read up more about that in my spare time, because that, that really does interest me a lot. But anyways, let's move on to the next one. ESP. ESP, also known as Sixth Sense, is a purported ability to receive information that is not obtainable through the traditional five senses. ESP is related to other psychic abilities such as telepathy, precognition, psychometry, and clairvoyance. On many occasions, there have been those who have attempted to convince others that they've possessed these abilities, usually through a very complicated ruse. For example, in the early 1920s, a Spanish noble named Joaquin Maria Argamasilla, I think that's how you say that, claimed that he possessed the ability of second sight. He would prove this to crowds of people by correctly reading numbers on a dice through a closed box. His perceived abilities garnered him a decent local fame and the title of the Spaniard with X-ray eyes. However, Argamasia was exposed as a fraud by no other than Harry Houdini, the famous escape artist. It was revealed that Argamasia would peek through the bottom of his blindfold and barely lift the bottom of the box in order to see inside. ESP, while being an extremely interesting concept, is considered to be a pseudoscience by the wider scientific community, as there has been little solid and testable evidence to prove its existence, as well as many instances of fraudulent claims that further muddy potential cases, like the one I just mentioned. However, there have been many instances throughout history that appear to only make sense with these abilities in the context. Whether or not it exists, I will leave up to you the audience. Secret Societies Secret societies are organizations that intentionally seal their activities or beliefs away from the public eye. The criteria for becoming a secret society is somewhat unclear, but a general air of secrecy is usually required. While a secret society may deny its own existence, there are examples of secret societies having a public image. Groups like the Freemasons come to mind, who make little intent to hide where they practice or conduct meetings. Due to the inherently secretive nature of these groups, some secret societies are believed to be involved in a worldwide conspiracy to establish a new world order. The Illuminati is a group that comes up time and time again in conspiracy theories as being behind the slow downfall of society. While the Illuminati was in fact a real secret society located in Bavaria, the organization met its end in the 1780s after secret societies were outlawed, as well as plenty of infighting among the organization. Yeah, man, secret societies for me are in personally kind of like a weird spot um, where even, you know, back in the day when I was like really into like conspiracies and like believing everything in that kind of space, secret societies just really didn't do it for me. I mean, like, maybe it was because a lot of secret societies, I mean, specifically the Illuminati, for me, was just, like, tainted by memes, and it's just, like, I don't know, like, wires crossed or something. It, I'm not sure. But, yeah, I guess I just never really was a huge believer in secret societies, and I, I think that's why I'm gonna leave it, you know? I, I don't think I have to have, you know, a super crazy, you know, explanation or insight on, on everything. It's just, yeah, some stuff just doesn't do it for me, and secret societies are one of them. Um, 
Anyways, I think we're gonna move on. Scientology. Scientology is a movement created by the science fiction author L. Ron Hubbard. Its official designation is somewhat unclear as it shares many aspects with a legitimate religion, a multinational business, and a cult. Originally, Hubbard created a set of ideas called Dianetics in the 1950s. These ideas were accompanied by a book and an organization of the same name. However, the organization would go bankrupt a short while later, and Hubbard would lose the rights to the Dianetics book in 1952. Two years later, in 1954, he would regain the rights to his book and establish the official Church of Scientology, which still practices today. Over the years, it has been the subject of repeated scrutiny and ridicule due to some of its outrageous aspects. For example, progression within the church is largely dependent on monetary payments by the members. Essentially, the more money one pays in, the more enlightened they can become and the further they can move along in the church. This makes the intentions of the church crystal clear to anyone who is not under their influence, and that is to exploit as much money from their members as possible. Additionally, members of Scientology are prohibited from seeking treatment for mental illness, as well as taking any medications that could help them. Instead, members are encouraged to use internally approved methods to solve their issues. According to former members who have spoken out against the church, this impedance of treatment has resulted in further harm towards its mentally ill members, and often culminates in suicide. While the exact number of deaths caused by this are unknown, it's unfortunately estimated to be quite high. Despite all of this, Scientology maintains a relatively positive outward image. The organization claims to have anywhere from 8 to 15 million members worldwide. Also, there are a great deal of celebrities that practice Scientology openly, namely actors like John Travolta, Michael Pena, and, of course, Tom Cruise. However, these positive figures may simply be exaggerations meant to enhance the organization's image. Estimates of Scientology members by third parties place the true number at under 40,000 worldwide. Additionally, the inclusion of celebrities in their ranks has been confirmed to be a tactic to disseminate Scientology to a larger audience, and has been actively pursued since the early days of the organization. So I'll admit, man, like, I originally put Scientology on the first layer as kind of like a filler thing, you know, something that was like interesting, but like, you know, a lot of people knew about, you know, pretty standard stuff for an iceberg. But like, now that I've actually gone and like researched like a lot about Scientology, like I'll admit, okay, I spent like at least two or three days going down like a Scientology rabbit hole. And like, as far as the beliefs and the structure of the religion and just how everything is just layered like oh man like i could honestly do an entire video about scientology like all on its own like easily i think i'm actually gonna do that you know what just in the future just mark your calendars or something whatever i'm gonna make a video about scientology because this organization is just so interesting and like especially with like all the documentaries and stuff i'm gonna have to watch all the documentaries on this because like I, I find scientology way too interesting for it to just be like a footnote in this iceberg so i find this really interesting and i'm probably gonna make something uh all on its own in the future so just keep your eyes open for that moving on the salem witch trials the Salem Witch Trials were a series of prosecutions conducted in the colonial village of Salem, Massachusetts for the sake of exposing witchcraft. Between February of 1692 and May of 1693, more than 200 people were accused of participating in witchcraft, with 30 of them being found guilty by a court and jury. Furthermore, 19 of those 30 were executed by hanging. Five died in jail, and one died through torture. The trials would begin after nine-year-old Betty Paris and her 11-year-old cousin Abigail Williams would begin to have epileptic fits. Examinations by local physicians found nothing that could be causing the issues that the girls were experiencing. John Hale, a minister in the nearby town of Beverly, 
believe these fits to be not of natural origin, but induced by some sort of a preternatural evil that had settled within the town. After speaking with those in the village and with the afflicted girls, it was determined that witchcraft was responsible for the illness. From then on, the town would descend into a frenzy of accusations and religious discourse. Many women were accused of participating in witchcraft, including fully covenanted members of the church in Salem, and even a four-year-old girl. Some men were also accused of witchcraft after attempting to defend their wives or servants from these accusations. Any apprehension or suspension of belief was taken as an admission of guilt, which led to many false accounts being leveled. The trials would take place for over a year. Eventually, those who participated would then look back on the investigations and accusations with a bit more clarity. Even John Hale, the initial claimant of witchcraft in the community, would admit that the fear of witchcraft in Salem was so great that it had likely impaired the judgment of the courts and of the community. In the present day, over 300 years later, the state of Massachusetts has reversed all charges of witchcraft and apologized to the descendants of those affected. The events in Salem have been used time and time again as a cautionary tale about the dangers of religious extremism and isolationism, and for good reason. Well everyone, here we are, the final entry on the first layer of the iceberg, and I feel like I kind of had to pick one to kind of send us off with a bang, and I think I picked well, so here we go. Gypsy Crusader Gypsy Crusader, real name Paul Miller, was a fairly controversial figure in the late 2010s and 2020s. He was well known for his far-right political views and his memeable form of content. He would cosplay as well-known characters such as the Riddler, Mario, and most famously, the Joker, while speaking to people on the chat roulette website Omegle. What's your relationship like with your father? Uh, I don't have one. <laughs> These shocking and often racially charged exchanges would go viral on the internet, racking up millions of views in a very short amount of time. Initially, many people, including myself, viewed Miller's live streams as a form of satire or shock comedy rather than legitimate hatred. However, Miller would confirm multiple times in his live streams that his beliefs were not satirical, but a real reflection of his opinions. It's like a, it's like a joke, right? It's been revealed that his spiral into the far right began when he was attacked by several members of Antifa in 2018 while he was attending a Proud Boys rally. Not for the sake of aligning with the message, but for the sake of writing about it. Before Miller was Gypsy Crusader, he was working as an independent journalist and had an extensive background in the martial art of Muay Thai, even winning several prestigious accolades for his skills. In 2020, his online presence began to radically shift from producing shock content to manufacturing legitimate hatred towards minorities and people of color. He attended multiple rallies and protests organized by BLM and acted as an antagonist, using racial slurs and alluding to violence should the protests continue. He also aligned himself with multiple white supremacists and became an open white supremacist himself. This shift in his message and online persona would cause him to be banned from many of the platforms that he'd once used, including YouTube, Twitter, Twitch, and Instagram. He was also harassed and doxxed by many individuals and groups. This harassment would ultimately grow to include his family and would cause him to lose his job as a personal trainer. He was even harassed by other white supremacists who purportedly targeted him for, and get this, giving white supremacists a bad rep, which, I, okay, just cu cut the music real quick and just, just think about that for a second. Giving white supremacists a bad rep. I... Come on, man. You could cut the irony in that statement with a fucking knife. <laughs> Jesus, dude. On March 2nd, 2021, Miller's house was raided by the FBI. This raid coincided with his increase in radical behavior and his detection by the Anti-Defamation League. 
He was arrested on three different charges, including illegal possession of a firearm, as Miller was a felon due to a drug charge he picked up in 2007. Six months later, Miller would be sentenced to 41 months in prison with a three-year supervised release. On January 31st, 2023, Miller was released from prison under supervision, citing good behavior behind bars. However, he was returned to prison after only three months, as he was caught selling racist paraphernalia and merchandise to his fans online. The tale of Gypsy Crusader is something that could only come from the internet, you know what I'm saying? Like, this could never have come in I'm Trying to have a heartfelt, spoken monologue about a white supremacist, and you're ruining that dog. The words that just came out of my mouth, holy shit. <laughs> oh, I'm gonna... I'm gonna get cancelled if I'm not careful. On some weird level, like, I almost kind of feel bad for him, but at the same time, like, he, he kind of got what was coming to him. I mean, you can't just go that long talking all this shit and expecting people to just take it, you know what I mean? At some point, he was gonna become too much of a problem and and I'm glad that they got him when they did because you know it, he really could have evolved into something that I think would be very bad overall for you know the state of just the internet and matters pertaining to minorities and people of color you know so yeah and I'm not really surprised that he uh, violated his parole and got sent back to prison you know that's just kind of how it is in this business, I guess. And I think that's gonna do it, folks. That is the first layer of the most complete iceberg finished. There's been a lot happening in my life recently, but I'm glad that I was able to get this out despite everything. As of this video releasing, I'm in the process of scripting the next layer, so just be on the lookout for that in the near future. These layers actually get smaller and smaller as we continue downwards, so it should actually get easier to produce these videos as time goes on. If you enjoyed the video, which, I mean, come on, like you're still here after all this time, you probably got something out of it, then please consider dropping a like, comment, or subscription. It really does mean a lot to me, like I said before, it just lets me know if I'm doing alright. Also, I'm potentially going to be looking into making some other videos in between the iceberg uploads and afterwards as well. So if you have any ideas or you have something that you want to see me talk about, drop it in the comments and maybe I'll see if I can make a video about it. Anyways, talk is cheap and your time is probably pretty expensive, so I think that's going to do it for this video. Um, have a great day and I'll catch y'all in a little bit. See ya.